Cafe of Field. Um, it's great to see so many of you here for this uh, night of botanical inspiration. Um, before we're all blown away by Joseph and Irina's knowledge of the, the Kingdom of Plums, I just wanted to say a few words about um, how we're all here and, and where exactly we are. Um, so I, I started Old Tree Breweries out of a, a love of plants and a belief in their so the, all the solutions that they that they represent um, about three years ago, and um, the idea was that it could sort of contribute to uh, resilience in this sort of ma time of mass extinction. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, for th over three years we've gone from brewing big vats of old flower champagne in an oh. abandoned sort of corner of an industrial estate in Lewis to fund ourselves to do environmental projects to um, becoming the in-house brewery of Silo Restaurant, Zero Waste Restaurant in Brighton. Yeah. Oh, great, yeah. And um, to uh, then becoming part of this project at Fields, um, which I'll, I'll get onto, um, and 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 now we're running this uh, botanical brewery and whole foods cafe, and then an uh, edible landscape demonstration site for two for the next two years. Um, we're determined to demonstrate to use this opportunity um, to show what can be achieved with uh, food forestry relocalizing agriculture and maximizing biodiversity in urban areas which we see as being essential to a sustainable future and economy. So, um, yeah, I'll just explain how this all happened. It all happened thanks to the internet. I found out an amazing article about uh, Joseph um, on, right, uh, on the Permaculture Magazine um, website, sort of saying, sort of, uh, everything Joseph's work. And then I sort of Found it really inspiring and immediately went on his website, found out that he was so with large audiences around the world, and so almost automatically filled out the form on his website. And I didn't expect All to get a response. Oh, Dream Brewery, Christine, who is my uh, chief of staff, she writes and she says, she says, I think you'll like this one, look what they're doing. Uh, and it just happened that I was planning to come to this part of the world, but not exactly so soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's all really serendipitous, like a lot, of these, a lot of these things. But in like less than 10 weeks of finding out about Joseph on, on, on the internet, we're now 50 of us in the room. How many gardeners are there in the bunch? Almost everyone, because I actually have a box of seeds here. Yeah. 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 Hey, I've got seeds as well. Yeah, we've got seeds for you. We've got seeds for you. Got seeds for you. Yeah. Got seeds. Wonderful. So, okay, just got a few words to say about the field, which is where we find ourselves in. Field is a temporary space that has been invested in to give multiple startup enterprises such as us and many others a place to establish themselves. The purpose of this project, Field, is to create a community that thrives on the free exchange of ideas and identifies the need of a potential permanent development, which is. Uh, in the process of being drawn up and is to be um, submitted this year. After creating the edible garden outside in the spring of this year, uh, we've been invited to talk with developers, uh, the landscapers, the developers, you and I, um, about including edible landscaping in the development. Um, and highly relevant in this is, is uh, hope to be the role of, of food plants. Um, and then I just wanted to share this, which is um, one of the developer manager, manager, Sarah, gave me this press release to, to share, which hasn't been um, uh, released yet, but um, that's got Joseph uh, in, in, in it, so it's relevant. That's a good role, press release about the development. Yeah. 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 Okay. The planning application for Preston Barracks and the University of Brighton and Wall Schools campus is due to be submitted later this year and the team of the landscape at the forefront. The application, which proposes a mixed-use development comprising home, shop, cafes, academic buildings, an innovation hub, and student accommodation, is being designed around exciting landscape proposals. And a botanical library. Botanical library. <laughs> and a herbarium. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Taking this cue from the South Downs National Park's biosphere status, um, landscape is at the heart of the plans. The Sarah Development Manager at Preston Barracks has said this, We loved working with Old Tree down the field. Who would have thought you could create such a green oasis right next door to a busy road, and better still, everything they have planted can be turned into food and drinks which are served in the cafe. They have inspired us to look into how food production and edible landscaping can be included in the landscape proposals at the end development, and as such, Old Tree have been working with our landscape architects, taking to Martin, to come up with something truly special, taking part in the other day, um, uh, to, uh, um, for the existing um, community in and around Preston Barracks. We are focusing on areas for residents to grow their own food, experimenting with multi-variety fruit trees, working with Old Tree, we're currently looking into whether there may be opportunities to graft fruit trees with local orchardists to be a real diversity, to bring a real diversity of fruits and colour to the green spaces on the site. 
We are also creating foraging opportunities by way of edible hedgerows, which residents and the neighbouring community can benefit from for home cooking and drinks production. We want this to be a part of town which is buzzing with all forms of life. Yay. On the 20th of September, World Food Plant Explorer and Botanical Explorer Joseph Simcox will be coming to field at the <coughs> Barracks. He will share his case for an agricultural revolution that will change the future of food and talk about findings from some of the 350 exhibitions he has been on. Of the 20,000 edible plant species known to man, 90% of the world's current population now consume just 20 plants. Joseph has arguably tracked down and eaten more plants than anyone else on the planet and his talk will no doubt open our eyes to the opportunities that exist to grow and create more sustainable landscapes which must continue to be a rapidly growing population. So on that note, I just wanted to thank, so to thank you all for coming and uh, make sure you have uh, technical drinks in your hands while you enjoy this evening. And um, we decided to make an hour of Joseph's first talk and then have half an hour for drinks and fresh air. And, and then um, an another hour, half question, uh, half, half more talk from Jason, or all questions and answers, if, if, that's, if that's a better idea. Um, and yeah, please enjoy these amazing porridge uh, snacks that have been prepared by Dan and the team. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> any, any announcements on this, what we've got, Dan? Um, so Ben, me and team decided to accompany the talk with um, being inspired to look locally and a bit further afield in the Sussex area with the help of our um, professional forester Rachel. Who's very um, so Ben, I want to introduce to you. Can you one? Like roasted rosemary and oregano, and just blend it into a sprout of hummus that I make here at the cafe. Mm. Um, and it's garnished with some flowers, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's all the flowers. And some lemon balm flowers. And some nettle seeds that was freshly foraged today. Yeah, um, nettle seeds? Mm. And uh, they'll be available on both sides. They're all things we've got. The other one is um, uh, the courgette with uh, dandelion, nettle, and hedge garlic um, pesto with some elderberries. So, enjoy. <laughs> Not really discovering anything new. That's the first thing to confess. And it needs to be confessed because a lot of people think it's innovation that I'm doing, especially when it's uh, seemingly new information, but much of it's been discovered hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and tens of thousands of years ago. So this is the first irony of this whole story. It's kind of like the bell-bottom uh, pant craze that it was in the United States and here back in the late 60s and early 70s. It disappeared, and now they're selling them in Macy's in New York City, and people are actually eager to buy them again. It was like a loathing period. They'll buy them pants. So, in, in the scope of human experience, it's thousands nice and thousands and thousands of years of, of a crude history that gets people to where they are today, but it hasn't only been a hundred years, maybe a hundred and fifty, that such a degradation of knowledge about the environment has happened. Let's try to put this into perspective as they uh, do acrobatics with uh, the screen. There's a big craze in the United States which probably has a certain amount of uh, influence here as well. It's called the paleo diet. People are really excited about what the primitive uh, human ate. And much of that focuses on a diet which goes back presumably thousands of years. I start talking to people about this and I would like to introduce it to you in a fashion that's somewhat um, alluring because what did primitive humans eat? They may have eaten lots of animals, they may have eaten amphibians, they may have eaten reptiles, maybe they ate insects, and presumably they also ate a lot of plants. So this is something which people have completely lost consideration of is just how dependent and how interrelated uh, humans were with plants. When I go to places, they ask me what I am, and I tell them I'm an ethnobotanist. A lot of people don't know what the word means in many educated parts of the world. 
And so ethnobotany is merely a recapitulation of what humans have done with plants. It's the relationship between people and plants. So for me, it's strange that this general concept of food is now being focused on issues like agro-industry, where they are telling us how we will eat in the future. And I have to ask myself the relevant questions to kind of extract the reality from the propaganda. Because much of what we absorb in today's world is propaganda, a form of bioengineering, a form of societal engineering, and a form of commercial engineering. So realities that we're presented with aren't necessarily real realities, but they're someone's construction of reality to serve their interests. So the first thing I always hit on the nail head when I start giving a talk, when, when I have an illustrious crowd such as you, is that the perception that there are evil companies in the world that are somehow taking away our opportunity has to be thrown out of your head. You yourself are responsible for your future, and you yourself are responsible for banding with other human beings to change the future. To say that Monsanto is the reason why you eat the way you eat if you live in the United States like me is a cop-out. You eat the way you eat because you've been lured into some of their devices. And those devices become quite clear in a few seconds of, of commercial. We like convenience. We don't want to work too much. The, the lowest common den denominator for human beings is perhaps laziness. If you give two people the same option, inevitably most of them will take the least exertion route. Ever stood in an airport and see the escalator going up and see the stairways right next to it and evaluate how many people will go up the escalator rather than up the stairs? It's a simple banal proof of just how we try to evade exertion. So com commodities are able to be sold to us and change for convenience. If things are convenient, we become easily uh, accepting. And this is what has happened with the fast food system. This is what has happened with our processed food system. This is what has happened in agriculture. 30, 40 years ago, when I was a young boy, I used to sit in the, on the farm with my grandfather in Michigan and I'd watch him go up and down the little rows with a four or five uh, till tractor, cleaning the weeds from the rows of his beans. People don't do that anymore. They just spray a convenient herbicide, which seems to be uh, better for everyone because you save time, you save money, you're more efficient, you're more productive, but you're also <coughs> inevitably a slave of the corporations which have lured you into accepting that convenience. There's a price to pay with that, and the price to pay is gradually we have lost control of who we are, what we eat, what we grow, because we've been lured by convenience. So I tell people, bad companies? No, they're actually, from a business standpoint, very, very effective. Monsanto has done some ingenious things. To give you a better understanding of that, before delving into the modern era, let's go back to the way the seed business has evolved over the last hundred years. There was the advent of commercial agriculture where people actually bought seeds. This was never something that had been conceived for most of humanity, people didn't buy seeds. They may have exchanged them, they may have bartered and traded with them because they were indeed as, as valuable as gold. They were the sustenance of life, but they did not buy them outright. The commercial development is only in the last 200 years that people start buying seeds. So as people were selling seeds, there are some dilemmas to face. If you sell a seed that is easily propagable, plant the plant, it goes to seed, produces new ones, you don't have a very good return rate on your customers because they only need to get it once and if they're illustrious, they don't have to come back again. So if you're sitting here dwelling on how to have return customers, um, you would try to think, how do I come back? Well, I can increase the varieties that I offer. You can do that for a while and then it's challenging to always come up with something new. Or they discovered a new technique. Allure the customer with something that's hard to get. So the advent of hybrids, hybrid vegetable seeds, dawned. And that was almost a miracle for the seed industry. And it also developed very quickly a following. Because you were to find certain resilient traits in hybrids that you wouldn't necessarily see in other crops. Because 
they were long and tired. Maybe they were slightly old-fashioned. Maybe they weren't so productive. There was something new. There was something uh, extravagant about hybrids, and they caught on. But in the process, they also changed the seed world. So every year, rather than taking the seeds from their hybrid uh, fruits and vegetables, the farmer would have to go back and buy more. Over time, this was very uh, interesting, but it started to unfold because people figured out that they could grow a hybrid for a number of years, do some selections, and actually have seeds that would almost produce the same thing as a hybrid. So as the evolution went in business, the large corporations had to think of better and better ways to entrap their customers, make them completely reliant on you for what they're selling. And so this, there's seats up here too, you don't have to stand back there the whole time, there's more seats up here. And then there's a little thing here. So this is the five minute uh, distillation to put a perspective on where we are with agriculture and it's certainly because of the brevity of it, it's going to have all kinds of flaws and it really gives you a bigger picture. So in the 1980s, agro-industry in the United States was pretty well developed. The concept itself turning it into an industrial element rather than an agricultural element actually was formulated as early as the 1940s, 1950s in the university halls of the United States. Harvard University is one of these pivotal think tanks that transformed agriculture into the camp of agro-industry. Speculation started developing a stock market, an agro-stock market, was all created out of this new way of trying to control farmers because they were an unruly bunch. They did what they wanted, they grew what they wanted, and there was no real way to, to manage them. If the government had an interest, it was to manage farmers because if you could manage the production and understand the uh, outlook for the years ahead, you could then speculate on crops and what you had. And so it was inevitable and necessary, as government saw, to somehow control agriculture. As that unfolded, the companies got smarter and smarter and smarter, and they started asking how they could further control the customer. How can you make the customer reliant on you? Go back to that little institution that I mentioned about lack of um, exertion. The more you can make something convenient, the more it can bring in interest. And so companies started producing herbicides, insecticides, and it was an ease and it was also an assurance, supposedly, that your crops would be able to uh, produce and perform in an adverse circumstances and against the competition. It has to be noted that what we are talking about, Tom, and I, you call it permaculture here in England, is it a common word? I hate the word because it, it just sounds, it's a wrong word. I'm still searching for something to substitute it with. I'm thinking maybe synergistic, but it has to be just a word and I haven't figured it out just yet. It's the point to say that our perspective of agriculture is not the perspective of the agro-industrial camp. The agro-industrial camp also has an evolution path, which is what I call the aggregate approach to soil. Soil is an ingredient. Soil is something that you add other ingredients to, and it's just a substance. That's how they look at it. As you would understand, as Sander Katz, you have his book up there, the art of fermentation. Can we pull that down? The world is filled with other biomes, other realms that are invisible to us. The, uh, the realm of fermentation depends upon a relationship between the food that we eat and the microbes that have a way of fermenting it. So there is another biome, the real world of microorganisms. As soil, is considered an aggregate by the agro-industry, it's treated merely as a substance. The way we are now understanding soil to be is just like a forest, just like a coral reef, just like a desert. It's an ecotope. It's a biome. It's filled with living organisms, microorganisms that live in symbiosis with each other and create this extraordinarily marvelous and complicated world. Part of our struggle as human beings is we want to somehow manage information and in the process we've discovered the great way of doing it by organization, categorizing, listing, uh, dividing and conquering and digitalization of a complex environment doesn't allow us to ever grasp what we really want to do. And this is the overall and constant challenge for these amazing uh, technological pursuits to control and dominate nature rather than to really be awed by it. Unfortunately, sometimes we just have to give up, and it may seem like an anti-academic approach, but I would argue that sometimes thinking doesn't necessarily have a solution, 
but rather just leaves you in awe. And maybe that's what we can get out of tonight because there isn't really a perfect solution of what I'm going to present to you because if you are um, bitten or smitten by what I show you, you're going to have a new neurosis because you'll constantly be uneasy and unhappy because you realize how much you don't know and that's what drives me to go around the world in this frenetic pace to continue to do what I do. So let's try to pull some more of the information together. So we have the agro aggregate perspective, the substance perspective of soil, treating it as a chemical, treating it as something you add to. Then we also have the approach of agriculture where we do huge monocroppings. Part of the dilemma that happens with agriculture then is we've created another scenario which is an inevitable uh, floating mentality among anyone who crops in the modernized structured agricultural method that they are fighting a war. They're fighting a war against insects. They're fighting a war against weeds. They're fighting a war against the environment because all of these things are deleterious or potentially deleterious to the things they're trying to grow. But unfortunately, as we understand, when you have diversity, you also have a different form of resilience. You can't just have the same pile of things and not understand that you will have possibly the same consequence if an adversary comes towards it. If you have cucumber beetles that like to eat cucumber beetles, when you plant 50 acres of cucumbers, you're making a giant cucumber smorgasbord for beetles, and hence you set yourself up to go to war. And it's very unnatural and it's very strange that we find ourselves in this myopic understanding of living with the world. And so in the sense that we're fighting those enemies, we're also fighting ourselves because we now are starting to appreciate, maybe since Rachel Carlson in uh, Silent Spring, that pouring chemicals on our soil is like pouring bleach in our bowl of cereal. It's the same thing, ex except that it just seems to be uh, tolerable because it happens little by little and we don't necessarily notice the acute effects. These are some of the things to contemplate before you get to the next point. So, we have the advent of biotechnology. Again, considering that corporations and businesses, as a business perspective, have to create uh, paradigms that allow them to maximize profits, sell as much as possible, and eliminate competition, because that's how they do it. So the biotechnology field was a perfect, uh, perfect way of doing this. Let's think of this. We started by giving patents to plants. There's a lot of plants that are given patents in England, in Europe, in Australia, in New Zealand, many other parts of the world. I still don't believe that Brazil allows for plants to be patented. I may be wrong at this point because something may have evolved, but I was at least up until recently privy to the fact that Brazil did not allow plants to be patented. Is this true? Anyone know about that? In Brazil, they haven't allowed the patenting of plants, was my last recognition. But because we allowed this, we were giving breeders and horticulturalists who were developing new crops the opportunity to benefit from their inversion, from their uh, investment. And so they would be given up to 17 years where no one else could reproduce their material without paying them. It works to a degree, but it's kind of not so perfectly controllable. So then the next stage that develops is the biotechnology era, where we can start genetically modifying our crops. So what does this mean? Are, am I correct in assuming that with this kind of crowd that will come to listen to a strange speaker on weird fruit, are you pretty well enlightened about genetically modified organisms, or would, would a nice a, a, a discussion of just two could be interesting? BT corn. Are we all familiar with BT corn is? No, no. Without, without, without growing. Okay, you don't have it here, but let's just, let's just say why it is filling all of the ingredients of a wonder thing for a company. For Monsanto, it's a perfect package because what they do is they sell a patented product that now is a systemic pesticide. Systemic pesticide against Lepidopteris larva. It is known that Bacillus thuringiensis is a toxin, a biotoxin for moths and butterflies. So what they did is, because there's a, a crop um, play in the United States caused by the army cutworm moth, it's a larva which gets into the corn stalk, eats it, and then it falls over, that they were constantly spraying systemic pesticides to kill an army cutworm. So what they were ingenious with is putting the Bacillus ther therogenesis toxin gene into the corn. Now what the consequences are allows a lot of people to call it Franken uh, uh, food, the Franken world, because we don't know what the consequences are. It seems plausible that if the pollen 
is also imbued with the genetic toxins of Bacillus thuringiensis that even the pollen can become a toxic butterfly dust. And hence, in the United States, we've seen an extraordinary decline in butterflies, ones that I can uh, verify with my own experience, not in a scientific way, but in the years past, back in the 70s, early 80s, I remember family trips across the United States, and we would drive for days, and you'd get out at every gas station, and I'd look at the grill of the car, and it was like loaded with butterflies and dragonflies and everything, and they're gone. Last year, I went six times back and forth across the United States, and as I would get out as a small child in my mind and look at the grill, there were no butterflies. Now, maybe they got smart and they invade cars now, but that isn't what I believe. I believe that we've wiped the butterflies out. Huge swaths of the United States are planted to this BT genetically modified corn. In addition to that, we've also upped the ante for the corporation to prevent uh, the grower of having any control whatsoever on his food and what he's planting. If you buy Monsanto's Roundup Ready soybean, you sign a contract that you cannot produce the seeds. If you buy the BT corn, you cannot produce the seeds for the objective of planting. So you already have a sealed dead-end deal according to a business contract that the farmer is dependent upon you to come back and buy more seeds. Why did they do it? Sounds great, convenience, lure these people in, plus they are pre-prepared. We have what's called the Future Farmer Program of American, FFA, and kids are taught in school in agro-rural communities that this agro-industrial approach is the only way to survive, the only way to make a living, and the only way to feed a hungry world. I like that talk about feeding a hungry world through biotechnology, especially when it comes to genetically modified crops, because there are poor voices like Nina Fedorov who was the National Science Advisor. She was the Science Advisor to Condoleezza Rice, who was the Secretary of State under uh, President Bush, George Bush. And because she was so preeminently qualified as a biotechnologist, she also jumped ranks, jumped over to the Democratic Party, and became the Science Advisor for Hillary Clinton. That tells you just how powerful this woman was. Parties didn't mean anything in her case because her cause was so essential to the United States agro-industrial complex and their approach. So what happens then is she'll sit before a group, huge compared to what I have, right? And she'll say the only way that we're going to feed a hungry world is through genetically modified organisms. And because we are also in a new state of food work, we don't really understand the state of food in the world. We don't really understand food itself. Not you, the enlightened bunch, the choir, but think of the huge masses of people who don't know where their food comes from. There are surveys, which we refer to constantly, that also involve the UK, saying that among 10 to 14 year olds, 40% of them don't identify milk as coming from a cow. And who can fault them? They go to Sainsbury's and they have rice milk, they have almond milk, they have cashew milk, they have coconut milk, they have flax milk. Why isn't it made of flour mixed with rice? That's where kids are coming from. So we have detached ourselves from our food so much because of convenience that we don't know where it comes from. We don't even know how the hell an apple grows on a tree when we're talking about our younger <coughs> generation. So they are inevitably in a precarious position to be told the way it needs to be. Think of all these masses of people who don't know where food comes from. It's a topically important uh, subject, but it's also impressive because it's happened in a mere Lifespan or two lifespans? In the last 50 years, most dramatically, in the last 100 years, most effectively, that people have really lost contact with food. So, what do we do? Well, Nina Fedorov needs to get in a debate with me, because the first thing I'll tell her is that she doesn't know what she's speaking about. Now, she's a glitterati among academicians. academicians. She's a national science scholar. She is from Yale University. She was the first to plug genes in and do uh, microbiology and show the plausibility of genetically modifying plants. She is a glitterati, but she also is myopic. And part of the problem of so much of what we do is that we have been forced to specialize. So when I go to world conferences on food, first question that comes to me is, where did you get your PhD? I mean, they're just ready and willing to put you in their bundle camp that you're another PhD because if you're bright, you have to be with us. No, unfortunately, I'm not a fucking PhD. I mean, and the reason I'm not a PhD is expressly because no one can teach me what I know. You don't go to, to school to become a generalist. I mean, try it. Anybody here want to go to a professor and say, will you give me a PhD and I want to study all the world's food plants? Doesn't exist. So, although I am, how do you start? 
this is the beginning of my talk, I guess so. Let's start talking through. Okay. This is fun, and I don't know what I'm going to do about it because unfortunately, I may let some of you down because they look like Willy Wonka here. I have never <laughs> used any psychedelic plants yet. I say yet because I don't have a moral qualm about it. I just am trying to be indifferent. So if I start using these things, I have a sequence of how I do it. I've used kava. And I've eaten a few hallucinogenic fruits, and I'm looking to start this in greater quantities. So they were asking That's what I'm talking about here. I'm going to talk about dangerous plants, I think. This is in Brooklyn on October the 8th. Oh, have to do this. Why am I talking? Well, Tom invited me, and I didn't know what Tom, I didn't even know he was handsome. I mean, he just invited me, right? <laughs> so it turns out that I want to spread this message, but I want to get other people uh, and passion with curiosity, because what this really is about, in some really simple and, and naive and innocent way, it's about being a child again. And somehow we lose being a child because we have all these responsibilities, hence the reason why I don't try to have any responsibilities. I do account for the responsibilities I have, and I do attend to getting to places, but I try not to have responsibilities that take away the, the innocence and the passion of living. Because another thing that may happen is that we think about life and we think about accomplishing things. And what it really boils down to when you think about it deeply is we're trying to evade death. By having success, by accomplishing things, we're evading death. In some way, we all are afraid that we end up in a grave. Just go to graves and you see that. So we are constantly living life to make life important to evade the preeminence of death. That is something that I'm coming to dawn on as I look at people's success. Have you ever watched rich, rich people, incredibly rich people, and they're 75 or 80 years old and they're still worrying about putting diamonds on them? It's just strange things like that. And the concept then is as we make important milestones and build ourselves in importance, we also are pretending that we aren't a part of the environment. Because another part of my story has to, to challenge another view, the Malthusian view that there are too many humans on Earth. How, many, how does that settle with a lot of you? How many people think there's too many humans on Earth? A lot of them, right? And probably some who don't want to raise their hand. So I've been to 109 countries. Among those, the best, best cases of overpopulation include a former British colony of sorts, Bangladesh. Okay? Bangladesh is the size of our state of Michigan. We have roughly 10 or 12 million people in Michigan. Bangladesh has 100 plus million people. I went through Bangladesh, and like you are looking at the environs of this former barrack, you see that there's all kinds of pieces of soil where you can plant, things that can grow, the marvelous diversity of life. I saw Bangladesh as something that needed more hands to dig it and understand it rather than fewer. That is really challenging. Now, what is the problem? The problem is a matter of how we do things. You know, there's stories about moral morality. There's a, a good example is about walking. If you're walking down the street enjoying yourself, you may be doing something morally pleasant. If you're walking on somebody's face, you're doing something probably morally unpleasant. So the action has a lot to do with the effect. And what we are as human beings right now is we are not paying attention to our effect on planet Earth. Because one of the great ways of, of making an equivalence of ourselves with other biological creatures on planet Earth is to realize that we're like giant earthworms. And this has been something that I've been cultivating for a long time because I see it as relevant. Do you see yourself, Tom, or any of the other participants here, William, William, as being a giant earthworm? I mean, he just went out there and he was super proud to show me his 800-pound rotating insulated compost bin. And I love it. But what I really would like to say is that should be our modus operandi as a creature of planet Earth. If we take all of our synthetic fabrics off, we just look at our flesh, and blood, we realize we're a creature not terribly unlike an earthworm. And if we were to apply ourselves as earthworms do, rather than being a, a detriment to the earth, we would actually be a benefit. Now, thankfully, at least at this stage, I will believe we're elevated from earthworms in intelligence. We have creativity, we have intellect behind us, and if we kind of try to sink it, it's inevitable that we will do things that are so extraordinary that we can't even imagine. So I'm not a person hating new things or new technologies. I'm not claiming that we should abandon all of our convenience, even though I've just uh, decried convenience as an allure to laziness and stupidity. 
But I say that if we merge the two, we become geniuses. And that's the next part of the game, because if we then reattach ourselves to nature, we see opportunity everywhere for changing a world. We've built these glorious infrastructures, cities, glorious highways, and they're devoid of soul. So what is the future of the world? Maybe this would be a small model, and that's why I feel that I want to be involved in it. Because as we create these small models, people come to them, and they'll say, there's a breath of fresh air. Somehow there's something different here, and the spirit is even good. So we start changing the world little by little. Passion, curiosity, the sales approaches of big companies, alluring and non-alluring, what we really have lost out on is curiosity. So let's talk about the Paleolithic diet one more time. Yeah, you want to do this, just keep looking at this. <laughs> GreatGardenSpeakers.com, it's easy to leave your feedback. Tom even printed this up. This is actually important to me. Uh, and why is it important? Because if I have thousands of reviews and I want to go speak before Congress, at least I can use that as a part of the reason why I should sit before Congress and tell these people another story. I gave a rundown in Hawaii, a two-minute rundown. That's how much time they gave me to testify before the Hawaiian County Board of Commissioners on why genetically modified organisms should be banned from the island of Hawaii. It's a county. The island of Hawaii is a county like all the other islands are. And so they gave me two minutes, and so I had to structure my debate uh, in a way that would not be the same mishmash and same rehash because everyone was hitting on the possible health effects of genetically modified organisms. So what I wanted to do was give them another pipe, something that they hadn't thought of. And my pipe was that we've lost diversity. We have lost the appreciation of the potential of things that are right in our midst that we don't even see. There's a book which was written by a German uh, scholar called Strology. Are you familiar with who wrote it? Yes, give me a minute. You're going to pull it out your head. So strology is this simple. He said in his ways of thinking that as we walk through our environment, the way we perceive things is much based upon our experience. And if we try to re, uh, reprogram our perception, even walking through a parking lot may become something metaphysically exciting. In other words, it's not only that, but then how do we restructure the parking lot to give us new life? Hence the reason I say that the way we created these glorious infrastructures with their concrete and their devoidness, we've also taken away from our soul. So we have to put that back in as we create a new future. So, Paleolithic. Am I bundling a lot of stuff up in a con comprehensible way? Yeah. I'm throwing it at you like a, a bag of shit a minute, so let's, let's see. <laughs> End views right now on this. Anything you like the input? Nothing? What about you? Okay. Okay, let's, let's pull some things out of this so I can give more fodder to create it. Because I'm going to talk about the Paleolithic diet because that is why we also are where we at. It isn't all the blame of Monsanto and government. It's a distillation of history. But do you think there is a Paleolithic diet? Because while I'm not sure that it's really been proved exactly what those people ate, and different parts of the world... Oh, well, the Paleolithic diet. I'm not, I'm not at all attesting that the Paleolithic diet is a legitimate or a valid diet and, and that it's authentic in no way in shape or form. I'm just talking the name Paleo to make that part uh, clear. That Paleolithic people were hunters, foragers, and gatherers. As such, they inevitably were eating different things because mangoes or their species at the time... Cultivated. Yes. Well, there are 67 species of mangoes, of which Mangophyra indica is only one of them, and that's the domesticated mango that most of us know. But if you go to Southeast Asia, then you find the plethora of wild species, which will allow me to introduce something else that's relevant to what you say, because domesticated species are terribly important, at least they seem to us, but in reality, sorry. <laughs> so the name of the professor was Lucius Burkhardt, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, but he theorized this around the 1980s, and he was a professor at the University of um, Castle. The idea was that you would rethink your space in a way that maximizes the options to use it. For example, you would take the students into an empty parking lot, and he would ask to conduct a class there. So he faced a lot of rejection because he was doing it in atypical, unconventional spaces. But his idea was that your perception influences what you can do with your space and with the nature that sits in there. So that's the absolute distillation that I can do on Stromal. She's my secret weapon, so I don't know something. Usually I keep her in my pocket because she's little enough. 
Before you check in the hotels, I say, okay, we're one and a half people. They said, two people? I said, one and a half. I weigh 100 kilos, she weighs 50. Okay, so this. Let's, let's pull this out again. So domesticated species seem important to you? Yes. As food sources? Okay, and why do you have that perception? Because that's what I've been told. That's, okay. what, that's what seems to be available. I've done some wild food harvesting and I've produced, you know, I've eaten wild food meals and what I find is there isn't much in the way of what I mean. Maybe this is my lack of skills as a, as a forager, but there's not much carbohydrate dense. It might be different if I was substituting with meat, but there's not much carbohydrate dense food available. It's easy to forage, say, leaf material. In season, the other thing being... But you haven't collected any porophyllum uh, roots, moisture roots. It's, it's a native asteraceae in the uh, dandelion family. There are also Lathrus tuberosus, which is in the bean family, which was commonly found through here. There's a lot of different carbohydrate roots that are actually on the British Isles that perhaps you're not privy to. I mean, we can walk out in the street and just see what's edible, but I mean, in the in the seeking for carbohydrates, mm -hmm. happily and surprisingly, there are thousands of things that produce carbohydrates apart from that poultry. I do foraging courses. Need to go out. I can show you some stuff. So, Rachel, carbohydrates. what do you think of all of this? Well, I'm not saying actually sea kale is one, but of course we have to protect it. Sea kale, it has a relatively large tuberous root, but it's pretty watery, isn't it? Well, it's mm -hmm. the thing is all the things they put, and then you say, what's, what's your energy in, your energy out, and, yes. you know, this is the thing, this is the convenience thing which is killed. Yes, and it's also to do with the fact that it's time versus, you know, because what one, what one thinks of is with pre-industrial revolution, how much time was actually invested yeah. And you believe, believe that? Okay, so you believe that? Okay, so this was. Yeah, she just opened up a whole ball of wax. So let's pull this <laughs> together. How many people have read Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel? I could talk about it. Can you do a, a summary on it? <laughs> um, <clears throat> that the current situation on planet Earth is not to do with differences in. But I. The difference between say how we live in Europe versus how we live in Africa is not to do with differences in race or peoples, it's just to do with the challenges that those people face is a part of it. I mean yeah. that's kind of, would you agree? No, I would say that um, Jared Diamond has a theory on how cultures evolve in relation to their climate. And he goes and analyzes how different conditions around the world affect the progress in a modern sense of that particular culture. And I have to say, because I know what Joe is going to say, <laughs> that you have to take it with a grain of salt. Jared Diamond is a geographer, he's not a botanist. Yeah, okay, the botan I gave the apology and I can go. Oh, yeah, well, the, the apology isn't necessary. What, what, what he's really kind of trying to say is if, and we were thinking about this just a, a week or so ago, if we took a bunch of Dominicans uh, who were living in this paradise isle and we brought them to Germany without the German uh, infrastructure, how long would they live before they realized we better do something really serious if we're going to survive six months of terror, the cold? And so this is what uh, catapulted people into developing many different technologies. The point here that I would like to address is Jared Diamond has a chapter, and you may recall, it was where he was in the jungle with some New Guinean guides, and they were hungry. So one of the New Guineans goes into the forest, comes back with a knapsack full of mushrooms. Jared's apprehensive, he doesn't want to eat the mushroom. The guy becomes adamant, he says, look, this is my forest, I know the good mushrooms, I know the bad ones, these are good, and they eat them, and they all live. Jared then goes on to say that domesticates, as you mentioned, are the inevitable result of people who have found the good stuff, and over time used it and domesticated it. And that there is one of the, the primary arguments for domestication. And it may indeed have some relevance, and we can talk about that. But thankfully, again, diversity and a diversitude of uh, situations proves that that's not the only case. The United States is on the continent of North America. The North American continent, if some of you are botanically inclined and talk about domesticates, does not seem to have so many. What kind of domesticated food plants are from North America apart from the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash? Anybody pull them out? Blueberries, certain species of blueberries, pecans. Uh, Apples. No, lentils don't come from there. They're from the, actually, the epicenter is probably in the Middle East, uh, Mesopotamia, down to Ethiopia. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me? 
Maple Acer Sack Aramia, absolutely. It's, 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 it's not a domestic yet. It's actually a tentative name that has a domesticated product. So it's tender nature of sort. Anything else? Cranberries. Maple. Maple, she already said maple, but right, people sorry, really right. aren't planting maple trees. They're tending nature in this case, so there's some okay. distinctions to make. Uh, the, the sunchoke, or the Jerusalem artichoke, Helianthus tuberosus, is a member of the sunflower family, and they're mostly from North America, and it produces edible tubers, which were the bane of those who survived World War II, especially in places like France and Germany, where that's all they often had to eat because they were <coughs> prolific and everywhere. So those are a few, but for the size of the continent, it seems rather <coughs> disenchanting, surprising. Yeah. There are approximately 3,000 to 4,000 species of plants that were used by the indigenous Americans, and this opens up a whole new question. Why weren't they domesticated? Well, if you've been to those beautiful places and you realize this huge, immense land also has a richness that's inexplicable, you may understand that you don't have to necessarily grow things in order to benefit from them. And this is the <coughs> argument which emerged in the 1980s about the so-called primitive toil of the hunter, forager, and gatherer. Because one of the things that came apart uh, is that the theory was they wasted so much time searching and living on the brink. And in fact, it was all malarkey. It was actually demonstrated that the various studies around the world in completely different ecologies that people spent much less than modern man on feeding themselves. Maybe 16 hours a week as opposed to our 40 hour work week. Oh, we have all the benefits as well, but we also have all the implications that we've lost. The biggest health benefits of the modern era are probably hygiene and the eradication of many communicable diseases. In the United States, now we have diseases of chronic nature caused by things like obesity and diet. Things that were not traditionally experienced by humankind, but now are prevalent all over our great country, and yours too. We'll start moving here. Isn't a, a lot of like commercially grown fruit these days like a much higher sugar content? Because that's what... Well, well like, she has that at, in her arsenal. She's the director of the uh, Mid-American uh, Mid Organic Association Marketing and Directing, and one of the things they are now hitting on is the nutrition denseness of foods and how it's plummeted over the last 30, 40 years. We, uh, I work in the zoo and like the lemurs that we feed, we don't feed them any fruit anymore because it's too high sugar content, the stuff you get from the shops. We feed them all vegetables now and that's not what they'd eat in the wild. They'd eat like fruit, do you know what I mean? But the fruit that we eat these days is so, it's, it's sweet because we like sweet fruit. Yeah. Well, really the impressive book to see the plight of the tomato is read a book called Tomato Land. It's actually an easy read, Tomato Land, and it tells about how the inception of the huge commerce with tomatoes resulted in tomato mafias people abusing immigrant labor, and the tomato that was mostly cellulose and not flavor. Okay, we'll go into the discussion. Here's how I started. So there's hope for all of us. If we start as a tiny child and we want squash for a birthday, inevitably something is already wrong, at least with the child. So by seven years old, I was raising squash and I was hand pollinating them. My first expedition started when I was was when I was 20. So this just gives you a background of the mania. Next, please. We'll just go through. So that's when I was 20. I expedition to the Blue Mountains of Jamaica. I had a Kmart uh, goose down that I gave uh, Boom Boom, who was my guy. This is in Ethiopia with two of my children back in the early uh, mid-90s. Expeditions to Oaxaca to the Xerophytic Forest with my brother Patrick, collecting, in this case, Bocarnia gracilis, which is a xerophytic, uh, that means a desert-dwelling uh, monocot which is, and this is in Armenia, collecting Rosa spinosissima, these beautiful black hips here. This is in uh, Chile in the Atacama Desert with the uh, Copiapoa uh, cacti. And this is, well, I wanted to be like Richard Simmons, if any of you remember him. <laughs> Great American fitness guru. So my, uh, my mother had given me a pink uh, white beater t-shirt, and I saw this wonderful opportunity right along the Bernie's border, and now these poor women are with me forever. <laughs> and this is in New Caledonia, and New Caledonia is an extraordinary island about a thousand miles northwest 
uh, northeast of Australia, and it's particularly rich in endemic species of plants. In this case, my brother and I are looking for rare uh, primitive conifers, one of them known as the Bois Bouchon or cork plant along uh, the river of the Rivier Blue in the south of the island. This is in Lake Tagumasia in uh, Fiji. We were going into those distant rainforests to collect rare palm seeds. This is uh, uh, an interesting talk. The reason it was interesting is I was the only one talking about plants, but it was, as you see, the Global Forum for Innovations in Agriculture. So it's just how crazy this is. <coughs> Remember the emperor's new clothes, mm -hmm. where the emperor is stark naked, everyone's praising him, and just going crazy without any concept of what is being said. So the keynote talk at this damn thing, Global Forum on Innovations in Agriculture, is a guy by the name of Mark Post, from Wageningen University in Holland, who was claiming and ushering in the new age of tissue culture hamburgers. And they were all cheering and applauding about this bullshit. And I was like thinking, this is the future of food? These people are fucking fried. <laughs> and was kind of, we, we actually sat down in Vienna, Austria, with a woman by the name of Honey um, von der Slagen, or whatever her last name was. And she was one of the first people to have tried this, and her exclamation was that it needed more salt. Strategically sellable at this stage, but prices will come down. It was 138,000 for that first burger, but he claims that we can ramp up the process. Thank you, Mark folks. I want to eat tissue culture meat. Okay, so here we have uh, my discussion in front of the glitterati of Holland. Now, Holland is agro-industry uh, personified. They have a population of 16 million people, but they have a quarter of agricultural output of the United States of America, which has 320 million people. They are the world's largest exporters of things, of oranges, of and all bananas. things, oranges. They have bananas? They're the first. Because they are logistically Defined. They bring them in, they pack them up, and they ship them out. They don't raise oranges in Holland for most of you to know. So here I'm telling these people, the glitterati, including the director of Wageningen University, who somebody said was the devil personified, about the future of food. And look at my presentation and look at them all wearing suits. Yes, they wanted to listen. So here it is. This is in the Suriname. So these are some of the tables which will get you excited. Yes, they are. I mean, they may not necessarily be among the greatest paintings or constructions, but they show something beautiful and simple about the diversity of nature. This is one I just took up in uh, Sweden. We were up in Sweden about four or five days ago. I told her, you know, we're going to Sweden, and I'm going to drive you 3,000 miles or 3,000 kilometers over the next four days, and we're going to see lots of fruit. And so I think she loved it. But that's why she gets tired once in a while. This is in Panama, different selections. I don't have time to tell you about everything, but we'll get into that as we continue. This is in Armenia, the berceau or the cradle of berries and orchard fruit for temperate regions. We'll be going to Kyrgyzstan here on uh, the 23rd, and I'm going to track down wild uh, apple species and pistachios and iliagnus, uh, which is related to olive but eaten as a sweet fruit and then various prunus, which are plums, and then even pyrus, rare species of endemic uh, pears from, from Central Asia. This is from South Africa. Uh, some cucurbit fruits, cucurbitaceae. Cucurbit, the word, actually comes from the Greek word, which meant a vessel, uh, kind of what boards then represent. So cucurbitaceae, the family of squash melons and cucumbers, is actually very diverse. A wild salmorel a melon, which is a precursor to the watermelon. These uh, fruits here are very strange looking to you, and they are strange to me. It took me eight years to track these down because I have been dreaming of getting to the location where they grow. This is from Oman in the southern province of Dofar. These are all edibles except for Citrullus colocynthus. All of these I ate except the one that was chewed on by the rodents, and uh, they all are spectacular edible plants, a Bedouin's buffet and you know practically nothing about this. So we'll stop here and I'll talk about the distillation. How much time do I have? Um, we've got about 10 minutes before break. To take 10 minutes, minutes before break, okay. Are we doing good? Yeah. yeah. We're, only at, we're only at maybe 20 slides already? Okay. We've got 20 more to go. <laughs> so we can take it long because I get to go home to the, uh, you see how I talk about home? I go to the hotel and I call it home. And then we get up in the morning and then we have to leave so we get some rest today. The great thing about food diversity is all these were eaten by those people in the past. So when we talk about tubers, 
I mean, we have this right here, either brachystoma or a seropegia, which is in the family of this thing here, which looks like a dried stick, but it's actually pliable and elastic and actually delicious, like eating a piece of asparagus. Or the caralumas, this is caraluma flava and caraluma quadrangulata, which are succulent milkweeds. Anyone a succulent collector? No, you're going to be after this because it's just beautiful. <laughs> the milkweeds, in the, in the common sense, milkweeds include dogbane, which are beautiful flowers, which are in your garden, which are great for butterflies. In the United States, we have about 67 species, 60 or 70 species. I said there was 67 species of what? What did I mention? 67 species of early uh, of mango. So yeah, there's 67 species of mango, and there's about 60 or 70 species of milkweeds. So it turns out that the milkweeds also have their counterparts in uh, the Middle East, in the, the, in the Horn of Africa, and also in India, of the, the uh, succulent uh, forms of the family. And they include many of the succulents, which people grow as hobbies, as, as plant hobbyists, but they're also very edible. Retina colon fulleri, it, it took me four days to find this because it was so cryptic. It looks like a dried piece of stick. It grows in a lunar landscape on the southern coast of Oman. And I, I had this friend with me, and he was going bonkers because he said, are you going to give up on that damn plant? I said, not till I find him. So it was 105 degrees out, and we finally found him, and I ate a piece of one, and then I took the rest of them uh, to a greenhouse, and they're growing them. This is an interesting plant called Dorstania fetida. It's known as and garlic. So all of these things are being eaten. And down through the centuries, we start using them less and less. Because what happens is humans then start agglomerating in populations. They start living together. And it is then, about eight to 10,000 years ago, at the, at the most appropriate explanation, that agriculture settled begins. With that, fewer and fewer plants are being used. And what I also introduce as my theory is that the copycat mentality kicks in full force, where Joan sees Jan growing a bean, and she decides that she wants to grow the bean too, and her little thing may be left alongside. And that's how, over the years, thousands of plants are whittled down to a few. Relatively speaking, how many food plants are there? Well, let's talk about how many plants there are. If you are a lumper, Anyone know what that means in botanical taxonomic uh, sense? A lumper is somebody who takes related species and clumps them together rather than call them separate species. Then there's the splitters. Oh, this one has this kind of flower. This one has this one. They are not the same. They have two different species. So the lumpers have fewer number of species of plants, 300,000 approximately, and the splitters claim there's around 500,000 species, just for the sake of effectiveness and for distilling this, I'll say that I side with the lumpers. 300,000 species of plants. <coughs> of those, conservatively estimating 10% being edible, that gives us 30,000 species of plants to work with. Of those, 10,000 species produce edible fruit. How do I know? Because it happens that genius is found in strange and unlikely places. There was a janitor who was working at the Homestead Botanical Fruit Farm Garden. And over the years of his uh, career as a janitor, remember this man's cleaning the toilet, he was doing a sideline. He was compiling and studying, as a part of his inspiration, the food plants that produce edible fruit. And he penciled them down over the years and came up with 10,000 of them. So a friend of mine by the name of uh, Ron Hirov in California, one of my mentors, an ethnobotanist, got a hold of this man's little book. And he was inspired from that day on that you better learn to find truth where it comes from, in this case, a janitor of the garden. So it turns out then that all of these species that were used by humans eventually were disregarded. If I were to go to Amman today after its miraculous transformation, nobody hardly would know about these plants. They're all driving around giant SUVs in air-conditioned conditions, and they have lost everything that they have. And convenience has pulled them out of it, and they don't know what is in their backyard. <laughs> Much is the same as happening in places like this, because the great majority of people will walk by salads. Maybe they should because people urinate on them, but I mean, uh, you get the point. Are we going to take a break now? Yeah. Let's take a break. Because <laughs> I, I will go after five, five more minutes. I'll, I'll pay what? Five more minutes. It's okay. Okay. We'll take a break. <laughs>
Thank you so much for talking with me, and I'll, I'll be thrilled to discuss things with you.